Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us at this lovely venue. Um, before we get started, and maybe by way of context setting, how many of you in the room have a Challenger Bank account? Starling, Monzo, most people, 90%. How many of you folks have a crypto exchange account? S about the same. Perfect. This is the crowd we want to talk to because uh, I have with me Julian Sawyer, who was a really a pivotal member of the Starling Bank team, uh, most recently Chief Operating Officer, and now you are Managing Director at Gemini uh, for yep. looking after the Europe region. Yep. So Julian, uh, what, what led you to go full crypto? What brought you to this moment? <laughs> um, I think if you look back at the Challenger Bank's stage, uh, and I joined as a co-founder of Starling in 2015, you know, uh, everyone said, you're crazy to do this. Um, no one needs another current account. You've got one already. Um, you can't start a bank, and you can't make money. Um, I think if you made those statements today with Monzo, Revolut, Starling, et cetera, you'd be laughed off the stage. So there is a, a really interesting point where I think there was a pivotal moment in uh, 2015, 2016, when you could see this opportunity. And I think where we are with uh, crypto now is exactly the same, where we're seeing uh, regulators engaging in a whole range of different ways in, in this market. We're seeing institutions starting to look, uh, and we're seeing consumers, not just the innovators and the early adopters, but we're starting to see more people uh, being interested in this market. Um, so I have to apologize that I haven't spent the last five, five years in crypto in the hard, in, in, in the hard space as, as you guys were all trying to build out the market. But I do think um, we have, as an industry, we have this real opportunity to pivot into mainstream. Um, and uh, as, as it was in, in, introduced earlier, you know, Gemini has been very in institutional focused uh, and we will continue to do that, but also in the B2C market. And I think that becomes uh, super interesting when you look at the comparisons between uh, the fintech market, particularly in the UK, which is incredibly strong, and what we can do within the crypto space. Yeah, well, we'll dive into sort of Gemini's or your plans with Gemini mm -hmm. um, um, in, in the region a little bit later. But I'm just wondering from a business model point of view, you know, one thing that the challenger banks all have in common is that they've all raised lots of money yep. at great valuations, mm -hmm. but they've been struggling to cover their costs. Yep. Whereas, as far as most of us know in crypto, the top exchanges have been you know, making money hand over yep. fist. Um, I guess, what's it like uh, at, at being at a you know, presumably profitable uh, bit of the industry? Uh, it, it, you know, it's great. And I think if you look at... Uh, the challenges in terms of where fintech as a, as a sector rather than challenger banks or crypto, um, what we need to do is get scale. We need collectively to be able to get into those earlier, uh, earlier adopters, but also the early majority within the, the, the standard bell curve. Um, now in challenger bank uh, world, you've got to just do that for scale. You've just got to do it at almost any cost to acquire customers. Uh, in crypto, it is a very different dynamic. Um, and obviously, there's an awful lot of players in the crypto space. Uh, I suspect over time that will reduce. Mm -hmm. um, and margins may even get tighter as, as comp competition really kicks in at this space. But I think overall, um, there's a lot of similarities uh, about what uh, fintechs are doing, what we're doing in crypto. Um, and I think a lot of this has to go back to customers. And I think we in this industry now are in danger of talking too much about crypto and not about solving customers problems helping them manage their money helping them to invest helping them to trade helping them to do payments in a different way mm -hmm. and i think that's part of the uh customer experience that we need to uh introduce within this industry now yeah which which of course uh, lots of challenger banks did do they innovated a lot on the on the user experience in the Correct. ui yes. and just making things a lot more pleasant Correct. um you know there is a sort of uh starling starling bank mafia you might want to call it lots of early starling bank folks mm -hmm. who are now across different companies yep. in fintech and so on um you know in crypto you see this with for example early coinbase folks yep. um do you do you see uh, uh, fintech folks crossing over to crypto more in the coming years and months? I think, uh, yes, I think we'll have fintech coming across. I think we'll also get bankers coming across. Um, and I think there was a, a, an article earlier this, this year which li li listed a whole range of 
bankers who've moved into this market. And that is really, really healthy. That is good to be able to have those grown-up conversations with the regulators where they've got uh, assurance about where you're coming from, your history, et cetera. And I think that, 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 that's super important. Um, I think one of the ob observations, and just going un un underneath your question there, is you know, people have left these fintechs. Um, and yes, they do leave. But if you look at the average duration of someone at a, a big tech company like Google, it's about two years. And so for two years in a startup feels like probably 10 years in a normal company, as we all know. So there is that natural attrition and that nat natural moving on as people want to do different things within, within their careers, et cetera. Um, but I, I think we shouldn't be thinking of crypto being one industry, fintech another, and banking there. We should be thinking about actually getting best team, best people, and they are actually across those three uh, categories. It's really the, the sort of the next generation of uh, financial services, isn't it? Yes. Um, Right, so let's get into the, the meat of it. Um, Gemini in, in the UK and Europe, yep. what, what are the plans? What are your sort of targets? Well, we're applying to be an e-money um, in, in institution in the UK uh, with the FCA, and also we are applying for 5MLD, which obviously has just, just come in in the last uh, month, month or so. Um, so our plan will be to effectively replicate what we do in the US, so exchange and custodian. Uh, very institutional focused uh, and also with our mobile and web uh, from a B2C perspective. Um, I think there is another interesting um, opportunity for us in uh, UK and in Europe where I think the fintech um, industry has, is probably more mature than the US for, for various reasons. Um, and I see there are partnerships with other fintech organizations that are looking for uh, a marketplace, to use that, uh, that word that is often bandied around, uh, or a partner, or wanting some kind of uh, revenue stream and, and, and joint venture, with a small j and small v, by the way. Um, and I think that becomes really interesting. So I think there will be a lot of uh, interesting conversations with distribution partners where they have got distribution, they've got product, we have got a solution uh, which they could give to their customers. So I think there's, there's those two markets of institution and consumer and then there's a piece in the middle which is more of the partnership one. And I think uh, particularly, as I say, in UK and in Europe, there is a lot of um, uh, very obvious can, can, candidates for those type of products. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you, you're, you really will be in a position to take advantage of this mature, well-developed, fintech ecosystem with which has millions of retail and consumer yep. users um, and, and potentially provide some services on the back end to them. Great, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that becomes uh, uh, really interesting for all parties. Um, you, you talked earlier about the profitability of fintechs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you can provide a revenue stream, that is really healthy for, for them and yeah. help, helps them. Um, and it gets distribution, because if you think about the exchange, an exchange, any exchange, it is an, it is an infrastructure play. Yeah. So it is about creating some infrastructure um, that can be used. And yes, we can have direct to consumers, direct to institutions, but also in via a partnership. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, if we can provide, uh, or any exchange can provide access to crypto in a safe, secure way, um, then that's got to be good for the industry overall. Yeah. And we saw this trend sort of start maybe two, two and a half years ago where lots of fintech players were introducing uh, crypto buying mm -hmm. as a feature mm -hmm. uh, during the last bull run, right? Yep. So, uh, you know, in the States, Square, Square yes. Cash, yep. uh, Robinhood, yep. here, Revolut. Mm -hmm. um, so it's re is it an acceleration of that trend, which I was user it, acquisition? I think it's an acceleration. I think it's also a customer experience. So how does that integration actually look like so you know is it just a handoff and there's a bounty getting paid back i don't think that's what consumers want yeah. um but i think having that uh, integration within their core application uh and so obviously things like uh, aml and kyc has to be worked through and things like that mm -hmm. um but i i think we've got to think about um this from a customer's perspective, from a customer experience perspective. And I think, as, as you indicated, I think uh, the challenger banks have done that incredibly well. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us in, in, in our industry now is to see how can we make crypto available um, and accessible to people and understood by people. Mm -hmm. And I think we are um, in danger, and this is my first uh, crypto conference, so uh, slightly uh, nervous today, but in terms of 
we use a lot of terminology that yeah. actually, when you get under the covers, do we really need to talk to consumers in that way? Mm. Yes, there's a whole underlying infrastructure, absolutely understand that and get that, mm. but we need to be talking in a very uh, straightforward, easy, simple to digest way. Sure, sure. And, but you know, I remember two and a half or three years ago, at the peak of the ICO frenzy, lots of crypto exchanges were having trouble mm -hmm. uh, keeping up with the demand. Yep. Uh, Coinbase, yep. frequent outages, Gemini as well. Um, um, and, and if you Google, there's lots of statistics yep. out there about the various outages. Do, do we think that crypto exchanges are ready for the next bull run, ready for prime time? Um, yeah, I mean, so it's a, it's a, good, a good question, a good challenge. I mean, um, I obviously wasn't in the industry, so I haven't got yeah. the, 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 the scars. But what I've... What I've learned is, A, the market grew substantially, and when you grow, you've got to grow capacity and capability. Um, and maybe the industry as a whole haven't, wasn't uh, set up correctly. Um, I know within Gemini, we have done an awful lot of work over the last uh, two years to, uh, to ensure that we have got that. And things like going to a physical data center, uh, a type four, which is very, very high availability, doing things 24 seven, doing better onboarding, getting different um, senior management who've got experience from other exchanges, not crypto exchanges, but financial stock exchanges, really just builds out the team, builds out the capability. Um, and we take these things incredibly seriously. Um, and I think those exchanges that want to, um, you know, not only survive, but succeed, have got to be able to uh, sustain both the winters, plus also the, the high growth mm. that that, that we've seen before. Absolutely. And m maybe just a bit of uh, forecasting or prognostication on your part. So people always say, oh, you know, challenger banks, maybe one day the banks will buy them, right? Yeah. Um, but do we actually think that uh, maybe a crypto exchange ends up buying some of these challenger banks in the not too distant future? Interesting question. I wasn't expecting that, that one. I was thinking when you asked that, it was going in a complete, complete different answer. Um, I, I guess the question is, why would you? Um, to be a bank has a lot of regulatory burden. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when I was COO, you know, if I made mistakes, I could go to jail. Um, that does focus the mind on what and how you do things. Um, and that came in after the last uh, financial crash. I guess the why would an exchange buy a bank to get access to banking services, uh, which is access to payments and bank accounts? What I think is happening, though, is there are more banks, more mainstream banks, who are now looking at crypto, who are now accepting uh, crypto exchanges, crypto companies within their banking system. I think if you're looking two or three years ago, you'd go, where could I bank in the UK? Um, and now there are a number of players, uh, which means there's more choice from a technology perspective, from a service, and also from a pricing perspective. So I think there is a... Um, you'd have to look at why you would go down that route. And if it was access to uh, um, you know, payments and, and be able to hold bank accounts, I can get that. But I think UK and Europe uh, is heading in the right direction. We're absolutely not there. And the number of uh, providers is still small, but there are providers and there are choice. And that's the key thing, mm. which we didn't have before. Absolutely, yeah. It's a, it was a huge bottleneck. Everyone was absolutely yes, uh, clamoring for the, for a bank account. Correct. Um, um, t tell us a little bit more about the sort of the customer base that you've maybe come across or mm -hmm. that you're planning to target uh, in Europe and and maybe in the UK specifically. Um, who are the f what types of funds, uh, family offices, etc. Yeah, I mean, I think um, from an institutional perspective all of those and, and, and more. I think what we want to be is uh, the go-to exchange. Um, the question is, why would you go to one exchange over another? Um, I think you go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and go, well, the first thing is safety and security. So how compliant, how regulated you are, how secure is, 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 is your infrastructure and processes, et cetera. Um, and then you go through more of the product features, et cetera. So I think there is a... Uh, you know, for us in, in the institutional space, it is ensuring that we are applicable, relevant to all of those, 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 those markets. And I think that um, 
is, is interesting, I think, from a custodian perspective. I think, uh, you know, we've got more coins available on that, which is therefore means that more people will be engaged maybe on our custody rather than our exchange and, and vice versa. I think from a consumer perspective, um, I think it's kind of... Um, kind of obvious, prob probably with my, um, my background, is to go after those people who've got a fintech product. So everybody who has got a, you know, a Monzo, a Revolut, a Starling, a TransferWise, whatever financial services product, financial services technology product that you have got, those are people who have clearly got a appetite or uh, an attitude to uh, look at things in a new way, experiment, try. Um, and so we've got to look at those as the innovators and early uh, adopters. But just as the challenger banks have now moved into that mass market, what we need to do is to follow, follow that through. So I think we will spend more time talking to um, those fintech customers. Uh, and we're very fortunate in the UK um, and also in, in Europe to have you know, a very substantial uh, market to go after in that space. Do you have uh, a timeline in mind in terms of when one of those fintech deals might happen within the next uh, uh, within yeah. 2020, you think? I would hope so, yes. yes. Um, so we, we're getting some questions in from, from the audience here. Yep. Um, here's a good one. Will Gemini offer a sterling fiat off-ramp and access to faster payments? Uh, yes, we will be doing that. And the other question is on Euro as well. So, you know, clearly uh, we want to make this accessible. I talked about customer experience um, earlier. Um, to do, to, to get a, a, a Brit to send US dollars to some bank in the States is not an easy process. It's not quick and it's expensive. So that's a poor customer experience. So for us to give a better customer experience, we need to be able to do uh, fiat uh, in GBP and in euros mm -hmm. um, in through faster payments and that just enables that and I, and I think without you know I don't want to spend too much time on the challenger banks but mm -hmm. you know when you look at the onboarding process and you can open a Monzo or Starling in account in sort of three and a half minutes that's the customer experience that people have uh, have, have now got um, and if you go back to what I said in terms of I want to go to the same customers. Their expectation is I can onboard in five minutes or less. I want to be able to fund my account. Uh, I want to instantly, if you're banking, instantly use Apple Pay and, and go and, and, and buy a coffee or whatever. So I think we've got to look at that customer experience and part of that is uh, being able to onboard and offboard on dom domestic currencies. Yeah, I should ask you this question as well since we're at the Crypto Compare Summit. So, so Gemini is rated uh, AA by Crypto Compare. Yep. Um, you know, just in general, how, how do you, what do you need to do to, to keep that rating uh, and to keep that sort of customer trust as, as you expand, which yep. is in some ways a, you know, a tension as, as yep. you get bigger? Well, the rating is a whole range of different uh, variables, which I'm trying to re yeah. remember off the top, top of my head. So there's a whole different uh, scoring um, uh, matrix. So it's a whole range of different criteria which you're assessed against. Um, I think... I guess there's two probably ob ob observations. One is, um, with the complexity of that model, you can't game it, okay? So you can't just say, I've launched this one feature and therefore I will get to A or double A or whatever. Um, and so it has to be more in the ethos, in the, in, in the DNA of the organization. And so um, we're particularly proud of that. I think as an industry, we need to start to uh, educate and inform about what does that mean? What does an A or double A mean compared to, I don't know if they go down to D or E or F or, or Z or Z if you're American. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, why is that important? So that is important for compliance, for security, for investment, for uh, all those criteria that is important to secure your money. And that's secure your money if you're an institutional or if you're a consumer. So I think as a industry, we should be looking and trying to communicate what does an A and double A actually mean. Um, and I think I saw something from Crypto Compare that about one third of all volume is in an A or double A exchange. That's great. So we, all those of us who are in the A's and double A's, how do we make that h higher and bigger? And that is really, really important, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, one more question from the audience here. Yep. What is your take on stable coins? Um, I think it's one of the most interesting parts of uh, crypto. 
Um, I think we have not yet determined what the right use case is. Uh, we probably know five or ten percent of what we could we as an industry uh, and industry probably being financial services, not just the uh, crypto one. I think it is super interesting. I think it's an enabler. Uh, and it's a piece of technology that uh, some great people, maybe in this audience, maybe outside, maybe some people in Shoreditch will go, I can do something really interesting. And whether that is B2B payments, whether that's remittance, whether that is something else, I think uh, we've got our own Gemini dollar. Um, we think this is really, really exciting. And in fact, when I was going through my interview process with Gemini, that was the one question I asked every single person, which is, where do you see stablecoin and the Gemini dollar going? Because I think we can see clearly where some of the traditional, traditional currencies, like Bitcoin, <laughs> if you call it that, um, where they're going to go and, and the use case for those, whether that's trading or an investment. But I think payments and stablecoin is super interesting. Lovely. Well, we're just out of time here. Uh, I'll take heart with that since I live in Shoreditch uh, to experiment with stablecoins. But uh, thanks so much for joining us Very and thank you for listening. It. Thank you.